On behalf of IDFC First Bank and the Economic Times, welcome to this episode of Ask the Expert. Our expert today is Karthik Reddy. Karthik founded Bloom along with Sanjay Nath in 2011. He has helped shape Bloom's investment approach and philosophy over the years, and Karthik has also overseen investments in some of Bloom's leading investments, such as Servify, Belong, Exotel, Grey Orange Robotics, An Academy, Healthify Me, and Raylia 3, amongst other companies. Karthik has also worked at companies like Amex, Reuters, and the Times of India. He studied at IIT Roorkee, IIM Bangalore, and then at Wharton. Karthik, first question for you. Where do VCs get their money from? Are you guys just an inherently rich bunch of people with a lot of money to invest? No, I wish, I wish. So I think, uh, thanks again for having me, Suresh, and the ET team. It's a pleasure always uh, to f- find these engagement formats to be able to talk to young entrepreneurs. So thanks for having me. Um, I think, see, the difference between angels, super angels, and, and VCs are typically VCs institutionalized because they've run out of whatever little money they've had, right? So they're not, they're not able to invest their own capital and they need third-party capital. Uh, you know, one of the jokes about venture money is it's, it's like OPM, OPM, other people's money. So, okay. so, so essentially it's addictive because every three years you've got to go raise it because, you know, you can't make fresh investments if you don't have uh, fresh money in that sense. And you can't use your original fund money to be able to play something in the fourth or fifth year because there's a it's a close-ended fund. So every three years, you're on a treadmill or a hamster wheel, whichever analogy you like. And essentially, you have to go and raise fresh capital. So you have to build a track record like any other asset manager on the planet who raises a mutual fund or a hedge fund or a, a it's it's no different. I'm handling other people's money. So the in fact, the thing that keeps me most awake is that moral obligation and fiduciary responsibility of handling other people's money. Because uh, Indians are generally trained to think of, you know, that capital as somebody else's and you have to give it back, right? It's not, uh, it's not very often that we can switch off and say, it's okay, it's somebody else's money. No, it's not. It's, it's money that you have to give back and hopefully in spades. So uh, it is, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a variety of investors who participate. Generally, uh, to, uh, not to belabor the point, but to try and educate your audience that that's why we're very cautious. That's why we have to think through why we make the decisions to invest or not. It's not uh, it's not because we don't like you or otherwise, because there's somebody watching over and judging us in a, in a quarterly report basis. Why did you invest? What did you invest into? What is the thinking? So they're constantly in venture. They're always judging what the input funnel is because they know that it takes an incredible amount of luck and circumstances to build a great company, which starts at a very early stage. So uh, therefore, it's a very small allocation in every large pool of capital. Nobody bets the house on venture. Only we do. Uh, the people who, who live and breathe venture capital and take all the money into a fund, and that's all we do. But the purple people allocating the capital to us are probably giving us 2 3 4% of their net worth, meaning us, meaning the whole exposure that they have to venture capital. Mm-hmm. And usually my favorite uh, sort of line is that venture capital is funded by what I call infinite time pools of money, meaning not on quantum, but on timelines, which is basically perpetual money. That means it's pension funds, endowments, family offices, people who are trying to build wealth intergenerational uh, or an institution offer a family of a personal capacity. And they see venture as a interesting enough asset class to increase the average return upward from fixed income and equities, etc., and that is why they allocate to private equity and venture. And within PE venture, venture is a subset of private equity venture. So about 40% of our money is from India, family offices, government fund of funds. About 60% of our current capital in this fund is from overseas entities, most of which are uh, sovereign wealth funds and uh, uh, endowments of one kind or the other. So the headline from that is OPM, other people's money. So, Karthik, just as a, f- a founder would pitch you for funding, do you need to go back every three years and pitch to a different set of investors to raise funding for your absolutely. fund itself? Absolutely, absolutely. Only difference is, you know, you have to, you you need to have been well behaved and built trust with your existing investors even bo- even before you can go to the outside investors. The general expectation in our business is that the existing investors put equal or more money in your next fund. In, 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 a, in, a, in the entrepreneur's life, 
they expect the outside investor to come and lead set terms and give far more money than I gave in the next round. It's actually the other way around in, in VCs. So if somebody backed me with $20 million in my prior fund, the expectation is that they put 20, 25 or 30 in my new fund. So the, that's the only difference where I have to go and demonstrate to new investors that my existing folks are already backing and giving me enough capital. And on the strength of that, I want to raise more. And will you also join the partnership? Right. And that's that's how we go and uh, pitch. But absolutely, we're not the, the other thing I teach entrepreneurs is in our life, it, I try to practice what I preach. It's never about going and pitching when the fund is ready. You've got to be talking to them all through the three years when you're not raising funds as well. So last week I was in Singapore at an event because it was a big LPGP event. It was a big event. I'm not raising money, but you have to be there. You have to be there for three, four days. You have to meet as many people. You have to you know, talk to them about what might come a year or two down the line. So a lot of institutional uh, enterprise-like sales that we do to get enterprise-like money. Which brings me to the next question. When exactly should a founder start thinking about raising funding? Is it on day zero, day one, proof of concept, MVP? When should I start thinking about it? The boring answer is that I think you need to have a clear idea on why you're raising the capital, meaning the articulation of what you do with the capital is more important than when, right? So people will judge you by, does this person know what they're doing with the capital? Do they know that it will last them Ideally, 18 to 24 months. A lot of people make rookie mistakes of coming and asking for capital for 9 to 12 months, which is a terrible idea. Because essentially, by the time this money is wired, you'll be looking for the next round, right? Uh, You'll have to start preparing. So you want to raise capital for 18 to 24 months uh, because it takes time to discover what your product's going to do, what your customers are, winning those customers over. So it's not trivial at all. So people who are under budget that time usually get into trouble. So think of what you need for 24 months. What would you do with the capital? Uh, like, you know, even if it's a high level plan, you need to know what talent you need to be able to hire, how much marketing dollars you need to be able to push this product, et cetera. And most importantly, especially the institutional investors, some angels who know you might say, hey, I know the guy is a good guy, a good girl. I'll give them a break. I'll put in 25, 50 lakhs if they're raising two to five crores. But the minute you ask for institutional capital, the institutional capital is thinking much like the entrepreneur, and where will the next round come from? They're already back calculating what the valuation will be, who will provide it, who could potentially provide it for such a plan. And therefore, you have to be able to sell through what traction you might have achieved in those two years. It's Actually, that's true of every round. You need to be able to forward forecast where you'll be two years from now before you start pitching this round, at the minimum, if not beyond that. Okay, now let me ask you the converse question of that. Businesses like Zoho's, uh, Zoho can't be called a startup. I think they've been around for too long to be called a startup. Zero, they have self-funded themselves and fairly successfully uh, successfully so. Yeah. We have many questions from our viewers asking what kind of businesses can you manage without VC funding? So how do I make a business without Karthik Reddy, in other words? <laughs> no, I think it's a dream business to be built, right? I think two things. One is if you have an insight or you're early enough in the market where all sorts of silly competition doesn't try to uh, compete with you and throw dollars at the problem easily, you have a natural edge because you have you can build more patiently, you can build more prudently. You're not in a race to win the customers. You might, at a personal t- time loss, might be two, three years to get to the same point, which is what the Zero Da and Zoho founders have shown, that they're not worried about hitting a milestone marker of certain series A, B, C, or a valuation in a certain finite amount of time. So if, you know, I, coincidentally, I did a podcast with uh, uh, Nitin of Zero Da in my current series, and he tells me the way he thinks about it is he also counts the 10, 15 years he put in as a trader before Zero Da started. Right? So, and he says, Nikhil was such a good trader, the, his younger brother, that Nickel's trading profits were our capital. So you need to be fortunate enough to get some capital from somewhere. I don't think there's a, something called a pure bootstrap. You either put your own you know, savings or your, your, your brother's trading profits or whatever. And then the cost of like your production, which is your people and your you know, almost zero marketing because the product market fit is so good. It is like exactly what a certain, even if it's a small set of uh, customers, you don't have to go and become massive on day two, day three. Even if it's a small set of customers, they love you enough that they're willing to pay on day one. 
So I feel where product market fit is so good that your production cost, zero marketing, is less than your gross margin of the product. You're profitable on day three, right? And so very little capital gets you to that point. And then you're not greedy for scale as much as profitable growth, which is what rewarded a zero, a zero da and a Zoho. It doesn't matter what they are today. I mean, zero da just announced their profits yesterday. It's close to 3,000 crores. I know, so it's a lot of money. Yeah, if they're, they're not a startup. But... They kept building incrementally and not waiting for a, a vanity marker. So when the market threw up opportunities, they were ready to grab it. So when KYC went digital is when Nitin says Zerodha just took off like a hockey stick. Otherwise, you know, paper process, getting stickiness of getting somebody to open a brokerage account was challenging. The minute that changed the odds because technologically you were far superior to the other top 10 brokers. So even in 15, 16, when we did our first co-investment with them, they were number 10 on the list. By 17 or 18, they were number one as a brokerage house in the country. So in two, three years, magic can happen. But if you have to build with the mindset that you're building for a customer who loves and pays for your product on day one, that's when you can build a bootstrap startup in my view. Our viewer Pavan Dubey asks, how do you get the right team as a new startup? Because I know you've said this in previous interviews as well, that when you're pitching to you or pitching to Bloom, you'd like to know who the team behind the startup is. So yeah. how do we answer Pavan's question? We've borrowed a bunch of research. Uh, coincidentally, from one of my alma maters, I was uh, attending a webinar and then I picked up the research notes from there. Uh, this is the UPenn uh, entrepreneurship sort of school. And basically, they've done a whole bunch of research around what creates great entrepreneurial stories, right? And of course, these are there's always exceptions to the rule. But invariably, to our friend Pavan's question, you have most successful companies are built where you have implicit like knowledge of your co-founders and your early founders and your early team which means how you've stood out as an exceptional person in your life until that point of starting up matters a lot. Why would people come and work for you, work with you, if you were not a great leader, friend, you know, thinker, and you've not demonstrated that? So even, even at Bloom, by the way, in the top in the investment team of five, three of us actually worked together at the Times Group, coincidentally. right? And so uh, it, 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 sh it invariably it's, uh, sometimes family, which is rarer, right? You see couples, even uh, we've even seen brothers and we've seen um, uh, both the stories, by the way, Zoho and Zerodha are, are brothers in stories. <laughs> the starting teams are brothers in both cases. Um, so you see family, you see classmates, sometimes as early as high school, sometimes uh, as late as your postgrad, BAs. And then you see work environments throwing you the best caliber of people. So sadly, your past is the best pool of co-founders and team, if you ask me. If you don't find anybody there who wants to work with you, there must be a problem. And then you're left like in the dating market, which a few, like, you know, there's a firm called Entrepreneur First, which actually focuses on trying to create a dating in engine offline. When they admit you into their cohort, they hope that you actually find somebody interesting to solve an interesting problem. The challenge with that, I feel, is that you're solving two uncertainties. Is everybody passionate enough about the problem? And is everybody passionate enough about each other? And actually, the punchline in all of this is what is there for the underlying factor for a great founding team? It's trust in one or two leaders, right? So it's like I implicitly trust that these people are going to build for greatness. And I want to be in on that journey. Right. And, and essentially, as, as, as CEO co-founder, you got to be able to inspire that. That is my that's my take. That's what we are actually looking for half the time. I know that's also tucked in somewhere into your questions, but that's the kind of, you know, CEO founder I'm looking for. All right. Next question comes from Parasuraman. Uh, we see a lot of people investing in digital businesses. Even the ones I listed that you have invested in are all digital businesses. Would Bloom invest in an on-demand custom contract manufacturing platform in India? Right? With PLI and with so much focus on manufacturing, would you uh, venture, care to venture into physical manufacturing? So coincidentally, I mean, uh, you should look at our website and uh, you'll see a bunch of examples. Uh, and bizarrely, specifically to that category, we have actually invested. Custom in contract manufacturing, specifically. All right. A company called Ethereal Machines. It didn't start as that. They were they had come up with this very cool five-axis CNC machine, and they originally thought they wanted to be a machine tools company and sell the machine itself globally and 
to other manufacturers. They didn't want to talk to the end customer necessarily. So they saw themselves as a B2B uh, cust- uh, you know, uh, manufacturer. Then what happened is one, people didn't believe how how these two kids could have built such a good machine. That's the legacy biases of manufacturing as an industry. And then they started getting custom orders, actually, for interesting parts. So things to be made with the with the five-axis machine, not the machine itself. Not the machine itself. So they stopped selling the machines and they started manufacturing the parts and started seeing the revenue curve grow. So it took four years for all of this, what I just said, to play out. But now they're on a trajectory which is looking like this, where you have international companies visiting their premises to give them part orders. So this is exactly what it is. But I would caution there. If you told me, would you therefore fund 10 other guys like this? I wouldn't. Because I, I don't see an IP differentiator or a moat on why that company would win against hundreds of companies in India or thousands of companies across the world. The reason I'm betting on this company is because their moat allows them to manufacture the same part at the same cost at half the time. So you can charge the same price, but your margin structure is probably, you know, 30, 40, 50% better than somebody else. So you have to have a moat when I'm playing things like manufacturing services, etc. I will not compete with a typical offline player for the sake of. The other things we've done similarly are uh, something which has an IP edge of some kind. So, you know, we'll do autonomous material handling machines on shop floors. You know, it's a company called Ati Motors. Coincidentally, both these are located in Pena Industrial Estate in Bangalore with their new offices, but both got funded this year. So it shows that even in a funding winter, the the idea that India can make really cutting edge manufacturing companies with IP differentiation for global customers has appeal, right? And so I would play if... A lot of those check boxes are ticked in some uh, boxes are checked rather. That's how we've had a few manufacturing bets, but I wouldn't do a classic services business for the sake of that. I know enough, you know, people I grew up with around Chennai, etc., who can actually do an equally good job manufacturing custom parts. Right? So that's not the moat. And for those of our viewers who don't know what exactly a moat is, can you explain what a moat is and what are the different kinds of moats that are possible? Yeah, so I think moats are basically, uh, is, there a, uh, is there a defensible, like moats are, obviously the word comes from building uh, large moats around. Uh, if you've read uh, Hagar, the horrible comics, there's a castle and there's a ditch around the castle with water. It's always around the castle, right? Usually with crocodiles or some really dangerous animals in it. That's right, there's crocodiles in those, in those, in those, in those, in those ponds, which have, have, happen to be the moats for the castles. So I think it's essentially... You know, we live in a highly competitive world. And if somebody sees you doing something well, and if they're already in that business or in an aligned business, they will try and compete, right? And that's the nature of enterprise, right? And that's why we get a lot of our goods cheap because some competition led to crashing of prices. So essentially, your ability to win against them cannot simply be capital and shrinking margins getting closer to zero. So you have to have a moat which allows you to either have a better margin than the other person or you have to have enough time advantage over the other person to try and beat you. So here, uh, going back to the specific example, the fact that you have a five-axis machine versus a three-axis machine allows you to complete the same part, same specs of the same CAD diagram in half the time. That's your moat, right? And so it has to be a differentiable edge which usually comes from either intellectual property in the case of pure pure tech or in business models, it comes from an insight or a behavioral change in a customer that nobody has ever predicted, right? So this is why Walmart said, ah, what Amazon can't do much to my business. And then Amazon kept chipping away because essentially they changed the way people bought the same good. Today, to the extent that if you go to the US and you see I, I, I witnessed this uh, six months or a year ago, I think. You're on a lane in the US and there's a truck of Amazon truck coming to deliveries. And they stopped, believe it or not, Suresh, at eight out of the 10 homes in that that uh, circle on that, that road. There's that many daily deliveries by Amazon. So and that's, that's a good day. logistics. 20 years, years, 20 years yeah. of behavior change. Yeah, just in that one, one road, right? And and now people, you ask a lot of people in the US, they say, ah, oh, our toilet paper comes from Amazon. Everything comes, our sugar comes from. So you, you've changed behavior. So that that stayed a moat for Amazon for eight, 10 years. Sometimes capitalism moat. Like today, if uh, Bavish of Ola is 
you know, built a reputation that he's a bankable entrepreneur. Somebody is willing to give him a billion dollars to build an electric vehicle, which you and me cannot get. So that's his mode, right? And historically, Indian conglomerates have had access to capital markets and that arbitrage over a new entrepreneur as a moat until private equity and venture came along. If you were from a business family, that was your moat. Sometimes, Karthik, I talk to friends who are joining startups. And the first question I ask them is, what does a startup do? And they say, they does this or that. And then I say, how do they make money? Quite often, I get the answer, oh, they've just raised a $5 million or $10 million or $20 million. Yeah. People quite often mistake, quite often, raising money for a revenue model, right? So when you say capital can be a moat, isn't that a pretty dangerous moat? It, it, it is uh, when it's misunderstood, is all I'm trying to say. In, when you're playing deep capital games, sometimes truly it is a moat, right? Which is why uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at, we even today have kids who come and say, I can do hyper-local better than Swiggy. Even today, right? So somebody comes, a kid walks up to me and pitches on the deck and say, they're not doing it great. I can beat them. <laughs> right? And I'm saying, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not denying that you have a fair shot at it. That's your predicative as an entrepreneur. I should respect that. So we respect that. We don't you know, laugh him out of the room. But the reality is that their capital and their other network effects are today are too large a moat. Right. And so what I, what I mean by that is in certain areas where the business model becomes obvious in some sense, the like when insurance was launched in India, it was a it was not in the private domain. But if you look at the first 20 licenses that were given, they were all with foreign JVs, but Indian corporate houses who had capital as a moat. So why didn't Digi, Digi or ACO win in 2001 when insurance came? Because capital was a moat. Let's admit it. And, and they had to wait 18, 20 years for insurance penetration to grow so much that 10, 20% of it was available for them to go and attack, right? And that's when the two new digital first digital first insurers emerged in the market. It took 15 years for that moat to disappear. So every 10 to 15 years, even in the most sophisticated of industries, moats vanish. Today, a blue smart is trying to challenge uh, Ola and an Uber because their, their moat is that I'm only electric. I have a lower cost base. I have a fresh start. I don't have the corruption of incentives and driver incentives that happened for years, I will build clean with a profitable model from day one. That's their moat. Next question comes from Pratyush Ayer. He says, Karthik, when do you know that this is the right time to blitz scale and just go for growth as against for profit? What time should you, at what point of time should a founder consider growth over profit? I think the indicators come from, uh, you know, watching consumer adoption metrics very, very keenly, meaning you will get you will get either the indication from the fact that uh, your your margin structure will automatically improve. You don't have to market to get the next customer. The word of mouth is happening to be able to spread this to the next customer. I know Dunzo, our portfolio company, is in a spot of trouble today. But in the early days, Dunzo was built with zero marketing, right? So when the new investor is looking, he's saying, oh, this thing sells itself. Service is well understood. It's all word of mouth, right? And a profitable business was turned to a loss-making business by virtue of pumping capital and investing in growth, right? Because you wanted to expand to different cities. I think Uber market. had that moment a few years ago, Karthik, when everybody, Uber, through word of mouth, all of us figured out what is this brand new way of booking a cab and all over the world, it spread by word of mouth. But it took, it took 10 years after that to go profitable. Correct. What VCs as an industry have actually helped the planet get in the last 40, 50 years is essentially take that one sliver of risk that nobody else on the planet is willing to do, which is they will fund growth when not always perfectly. There will be enough blow ups. I'm not saying no, but I'm saying they will fund growth when they see this consumer behavior change at massive scale. To your point, Suresh, the best cases, best examples of that kind of growth uh, are not even the uh, tech revolutions of the 70s, 80s, right? Which was still technology driven. Look, if you look at the business model ones, which were driven by this, um, our friends at um, Facebook and Twitter would be some of the best examples, right? So what, what, is, what is the VC basically saying? That, gosh, this thing is spreading like wildfire. Has no, still has no idea how to make money. But 
in the us if you build a media network with eyeballs and you know attention you can monetize it because the ad pie is big enough you can't necessarily say that about a vietnam or a saudi arabia or an india right to be able to pay the same valuations but oh, so US, eyeballs are not eyeballs across countries because eyeballs only monetize ad through ad dollars not and through wallet subscription yeah. wallets right yeah. even subscription like you know netflix has learned the hard way that content you build in india has got to be more selective and cheaper because you're, you're going to get 249 rupees which is today only bizarrely 3 dollars whereas in the us you can make 10 to 12 dollars off that customer so your production cost can be four times more in the us to deliver the same profit right so i think these are these are things you need to watch but if you're mindful of that when you see customer adoption and i think only customer love should trigger a blitz scale of growth not <laughs> two people sitting in a board room saying that we think we can grow and we can throw money at the problem and solve it so what happens then is that growth dollar gets misconstrued for um you know buying growth artificially so you're trying to inculcate behavior artificially and even the best of companies have done this right but i think the best of companies would have done it in a more calibrated way so that they don't go under that's all you got to be careful that in those experiments if they fail you shouldn't go under so amazon was loss making when it went public yeah. right but basically there was no issue around um there was no issue around uh a situation where they would get so unprofitable that they would collapse right and they calibrated this blitz scaling is an overused term they, you have to blitz scale at a point in time you can't you can't blitz scale at any point in time right so when they whenever they saw upticks in books they spend more money when they saw uptick in a new category they spend more money right they didn't come into india in till 2012 13 because they didn't see a reason to blitz scale in india right they would go to a better market with better margins with more similarities to their home market and not come into india that's that's exactly the right way to blitz scale if you ask me next question comes from snigda kedia and stick that to your point asks how do you reduce the burn rate of ad spends or performance marketing when either scaling or blitz scaling a d2c business because if you open your instagram app you see hundreds or dozens of ads for d2c businesses from skin care to clothing to beauty to footwear a friend of mine compared it to the old uh, gold rush in california that the only people who made money are the ones who sold uh, shovels and spades the so instagram has become the shovel and spade of the digital generation essentially snigda's question is how do you reduce the burn rate of ad spends in performance marketing especially with a d2c business and you want to scale it i'm not an expert i would say i mean um, you should you should read some of the the best pieces by performance marketers uh, in fact rahul of uh, purple uh, one of our best companies in d2c um, actually just released we released an interview of his where he speaks exactly about this how to control performance marketing spends uh literally in the last uh, 48 hours uh please mind that snigta and read i'm not an expert in performance marketing per se i think intuitively what i've seen uh, through many many companies lenses is that um you got to be even there you got to be clever about how you differentiate the messaging of the brand uh people have like everybody tries a different approach right you do uh, celebrity marketing so a lot of people actually give up equity in the company but get like a long term celebrity engaged with them right that's one way to do it if you have the courage to and if you can get the brand alignment with the celebrity if you get the right celebrity to buy it uh we are trying to do that in multiple uh, brands of ours so that gives you incredible visibility without having to buy eyeballs every time right so that's that's one uh, that's one hack um the other could be optimizing channel based distribution better so it's very difficult to get discovered in an amazon or in a um uh, in a flipkart but and similarly it is easier said than done to crack offline distribution uh but is there a way to align with some other you know brands offline or online and get more visibility and distribution even today even you're getting charged even for that right somebody who gives you a sample on vistara also pays today somebody who gives you a sample through uh, danzo historically used to pay for it right so uh, if you want your uh, swiggy bike to look like a certain brand image you have to pay for it so everyone's getting smart or also getting smart that um ad dollars have gone disproportionately to google and facebook so we should also charge so anywhere where you get a lot of screen time or visibility is becoming expensive so you got to be clever about 
at pace at which you grow your brand to be honest and it goes back to customer love video testimonials selling the stories around those on youtube and insta creatively uh of course to to pump it up they will charge you more but you have to avoid that temptation and hope that you know you get a die hard uh, early adopter base that promotes you more than performance marketing next question is a highly personal question for you kartik even sure. after i am why did you choose to go to wharton yeah i get asked this a lot obviously <laughs> two mbas are not common nowadays it used to be it for one phase i think we were one of the last batches at imb uh where there was zero overseas placements right that trend started a few years after we graduated so one i think there was always a few of us who were yearning to get out of the country and explore the world per se and uh, and i had actually foregone that option uh, after industrial engineering uh, my option was imb or masters of science in uh, in michigan or texas austin i had about four five admissions so i think it's personal i don't think there's a logical decision around it there was a yearning to go i tried to go through a parallel job and because now i had done my i am and uh, had more like finance jobs and those froze because of the asian crisis back then and uh, and that itch could only be fulfilled and logically i convinced myself that if i had gone for my masters in science i would be applying for the exact same batch at port so you can always convince yourself and fool yourself with any amount of logic right as long as it suits you so i i i said 99 is when i would apply for my wharton mba why am i overthinking this let me put in the effort and uh, i got into a couple of schools but i was over indexed on this should be worth it right for spending that kind of time and money uh, and it paid off in two ways i think uh, no plug for wharton per se but like phenomenally uh, flexible curriculum so actually i got a triple major finished most of my finance stuff in the first year got to dabble with entrepreneurship and landed in the heart of the dot com boom and bust boom was first year of college bust was second year of college so the educative lesson you got without any a uh, job or financial commitment to that industry was phenomenal so i learned a lot my switch to technology as a you know uh, or at least a observer and financier of technology for a long term career choice was shaped by my those two years at, at at business school so i think professionally and you know i have big backers because of my history from there one of my early backers was a uh, big backer was from the school so it paid off in more ways than one touch would Secondly I met my wife's a painter but she was at the arts program at UPenn and I met her within the first week of going to school that seems to be the real reason that's the killer reason I always say that I always say that to everyone that you know you don't know what you're fated for the world the universe conspires in various ways including you know creating this illusion of a double mba but the reasons were very different I found my career choice and life choice right so romance is not entirely excluded when you go to Wharton All right. Keeping with the line of personal questions, Meera Ravi asks you, Karthik, describe an early failure and how did you pivot? Oh, plenty. Um, <laughs> no, I think a failure. Failure was only. I would. I would say the most direct failure was um, was a startup that I tried. Uh, taught me a lot of things about how I evaluate startups and the mistakes I see other entrepreneurs making. Uh, started with a co-founder. who was still in his day job was not fully committed so was i for that matter didn't have work visa status in the us that would allow me to uh, be on my on this as a job i feel like startups and and uh, what i fund are all a probability game right so the biggest lesson from that failure and what forced me to pivot was to park that dream for 5 6 years so pivots don't have to be instantaneous they can be basically career defining in terms of what work do you need to put in before you come back as an entrepreneur and for me i i decided that i have such diverse interests from that experience that i said i'd rather be a venture capitalist than an entrepreneur and to that extent i'm still i shape i think i try to shape my dream the way i wanted to as being a founder of a firm and we've gone from two people in a coffee shop to 45 people and you know 20 million in that first fund to 600 million so we are shaping our own entrepreneurial journey uh in our own way but basically the learnings from that were you have to be 110% committed right you can't surround yourself with ingredients that reduce probability of success it's the most stupid way to be entrepreneurial right you got to increase everything that 
you bring to the table has got increased probability of success or reduced probability of failure, not reduced probability of success. So I think that's one of my punchlines. And, and that's what I think I learned from that experience where basically you didn't have a work visa. You tied up with someone who was on the fence always, didn't jump in. We didn't have technology resources. We were like old school. Pre-2010 used to think that tech could be built by somebody outside the firm. Now we don't touch. I've made mistakes even four or five years ago backing a team like that. So you don't learn from your mistakes fast enough. But that can happen as well, right? It can happen to the smartest people in the world that you don't yeah. learn from mistakes. So it's a, it's a no-no uh, nowadays. So I think you learn things like that where you if you're building a tech business, everything's got to be in-house. You'd rather wait past how much ever you love them if those ingredients are not in-house. And that was the learning from my experience. Like if I think I'd gone, it was in media, it was in video actually. It was, by the way, my, my first deck was pre-YouTube. And it had a very YouTube-like feel to it in the sense that it would uh, focus on ethnic content in the US, right? Which was a booming category on satellite TV, but nothing on the web, right? And and so that was the idea, but you just didn't have the tech chops to build something like that. And like you said, you had multiple reasons for failure, multiple failure factors built in the visas and everything else. That apart, I'm just saying you, you couldn't have, with that kind of money, you would have to go raise money. You would have to get somebody who's a tech co-founder, not two businessy guys who are dreaming up the idea, but not executing it. Things like that. So I feel you have to be, I think the biggest learning was you've got to be 110% committed that this can eat up the next 10, 20 years of your life. And so I've chosen something like venture, which actually it's a 30, 40 years of your life. And there's no 10, 20 checkout. It's 13 years. And I feel like I haven't even finished cycle one, right? So these take long time. You're in it for a while. Okay. Somit Basak asks the next question. I'm just going to caveat that question a little bit. Karthik, a little while ago, you spoke about something called a funding winter, right? Now, regular human beings, we go through summer, we go through monsoon, we go through winter. It doesn't mean everything shuts down in a personal winter. You just wear warm clothing or carry an umbrella and go about your business. But in this context, Somit's question is particularly relevant. He says, uh, when a company gets funded, now this sort of ensures that their business model is validated, there's due diligence done on them, the VCs have to do their share of work before funding them. If that were true, why are so many startups failing after securing multiple rounds of funding in this so-called funding winter? Should they not have planned for it? Should they not be able to weather it fairly easily? Yeah, it goes back to the origins of venture capital, right? I mean, if this was so predictable and if there was such a path to profitability, that business is theoretically not the right candidate for venture capital. So, for example, if you build a feasibility plan out and you want to start a sort of a, a timber sawmill or a, or a small manufacturing plant outside Bangalore or Bombay, you won't go take venture capital because you know that once that first round of capital is raised, other than bank debt to finance working capital, you would never require to raise equity capital again, unless you wanted to expand and grow faster. That should be the only reason to grow. Now to ask that of a venture capital funded model that with the C round, with the A round, with the B round, you definitely have to get profitable and survive. Defeats the whole purpose. Which means you are building a model that is either subscale in its end state or, you know, didn't have growth at a, at a pace and scale that was required to build a very large business. So you resorted to profitability and said, I'll, I'll, I'll get, you know, normalized like any other business to profitability rather than to growth, right? Third, there are businesses where if you're fundamentally game changing or defining the way a certain industry or a certain consumer behavior works, it takes a lot more dollars than a typical business because you couldn't have solved food delivery unless you had solved an entire city's coverage almost to the extent of 100%. So when you're building a new marketplace from scratch, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Uh, it's not going to happen without the ability to finance both sides of the marketplace and grow it. Now, suppose in the middle of this planning, the VC and the entrepreneur thought that the next round is a given. It's going to come, right? Suddenly, the winter hits and it doesn't come. It's not possible in most businesses to suddenly turn off the switch and get to profitability. So when you see a lot of unicorns survive today, if theoretically, I'm, I'm just saying theoretically, 
if they had raised two three hundred million dollars in the funding boom of twenty one, let us say they had not raised two three hundred and raised only fifty sixty million, a lot more of them could have been in trouble. But because they raised so much and they could cut costs quickly, they have a cushion to give them three four years to profit. Right now, that same argument might not hold for someone who raised four five million dollars or two three million dollars, because the cost base, the path to profitability is not short enough that they can get there on the basis of basically simply trying to get to profitability is not a goal that you can artificially set mid course. Right, so that's when in funding winters you tend to see a lot of M and A. You see distress acquisitions because people are running out of money and there's no way you can survive. And a good founder sometimes will say, "I've been set back so much in my path to growth and profitability that I can't, uh, I can't motivate a team to stay with me for another four years to try and get the next round of capital." So sometimes just for that reason, you will sell the business and move on. So a lot of edtech businesses which were subscale. That's probably what's happening today. Okay, so then the next obvious question that uh, emerges from there is, in your personal view, when will this winter end? I think it's a slow process. So typically, what happens is when people have capital, which is in the industry called dry powder, they're always looking for things to invest into. So the two things that happen, they double down on things they've understood very well, which is in their own portfolio, or they're looking at very very selective sort of bullets to fire. Right. So if they Have a very strong thesis. That's why I said two of my manufacturing plays got funded this year. They actually didn't get funded in the last three years, right? Because the trend to China plus one and India building a manufacturing powerhouse is a new trend. So VCs tend to follow trends and say what is interesting to invest into. So it's not like it's all dead. Of course, it's subdued, but it's not like it's dead and nobody is getting funded, right? But what happens is there's no compulsion to chase something because you look around you and the herd is not moving at rapid speed. Right, so you feel like I don't have to overpay for assets. I don't have to cut five checks. I don't. I will not miss something for you know uh, it because I didn't act in a hurry. So things naturally, everybody does that, and then suddenly it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where nobody actually is in a tearing FOMO sort of position, and that uh, that basically reduces the pace. Um, so what we're beginning to see, as you can can observe, is anything which is going or has a path to profitability and has a chance to go public. It gets most interest, right? Someone like a Lenskart got five hundred million, predominantly secondary. What does it say? It says that even if the company don't doesn't need money, I want to buy the stock. That's like buying a public stock. If so I remember it, uh, a speech that Adi Godrich made. Hmm. He said, "Raise money when you can, not when you need it." That's absolutely right. When the company is cruising, people want to give it money, right? And then he couldn't take money because he doesn't want to dilute at that price. He doesn't have anybody any reason to. He already has a few hundred in the bank. So then somebody else sells their shares, which is the beauty of what what we call as equity, right? So it can trade hands. If you made enough money, you'll happily sell your position, and that's the best holy grail of where capital is coming right now. Now, similarly, if you if people see there's a predictability even at Series B to profitability or becoming a market leader, then you're the next best candidate in that value chain. Right. If you are selling something which is highly competitive or no visibility, there's nothing about winter. It's just a reset. Nobody's ever going to fund you again. Winter or no winter. Yeah, winter or no winter. That reset has happened suddenly because it's summer next uh, next uh, July. It doesn't mean that you're going to get money necessarily. You got to if you feel passionately enough, get to profitability and survive. Then no one can kill you, na. Survival is in your hands, right? The, so you can't blame the market for survival. If you can't get there, then you're 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 in trouble. So I feel like that. Slow comeback will happen either on the back of trend lines, public market sentiment, or you know, actual more and more companies getting closer to profitability. So all of which means there's still eight, eight six to eight, nine months of clean up to happen, and then momentum will be driven by, as I said, you know. And by the way, we have our own portfolio. I'm not saying anybody's portfolio in this country is immune from a few shocks. So when you have those shocks in your own portfolio, you tend to hesitate. You want to first see those cleaned up one way or the other before you start taking more risk. It's just psychological, right? So if I, that clean up has not happened, I suddenly can't go take crazy amount of new risk. I will take it very, very calibrated. So I feel it's a virtuous cycle that has to play out right now. It's I think the bottom of the vicious cycle that's playing out. By the time it translates itself to virtuous, it's going to take another nine months to twelve months. Right. So you've got to hold on to your winter jackets for nine to twelve months. 
uh, Karthik, if you've seen the show Silicon Valley, my yeah. friends who live in the actual valley tell me this is creepily close to the real world, creepily close to, a, to what happens in actual Silicon Valley. But my question to you is about VCs themselves. In the show, VCs are so shown as this highly nervous people with a strong sense of FOMO. And they're funding yeah. business merely because they don't want to miss out on the next boom or the next trend. Are VCs also given to FOMO-like feelings? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Many, many phrases that describe this. So somebody said, um, uh, you know, when the when the surf's up, everybody needs to, when the waves are up, everybody wants to go surf, right? So it's like somebody described this in this way that all the VCs are sitting on the beach and then waiting for the first guy to go catch the wave. And when he's and when he surfs well, everybody runs into surf, right? So it's catching waves, literally speaking. So that's the analogy. Uh, so if there's an AI wave, everybody wants to catch the wave. That's our business, right? Something new, radical is happening. You want to catch a wave. Climate is a wave. So people want to catch climate tech as a wave, right? So these are every few years, you'll have a couple of these waves, right? Waves might come because of technology, regulation, or seeing a comparable market. And saying China may or right? And technology because 4G and geo threw up something, UPI threw up something. That's what I mean. So regulatory plus tech throws up waves. Second is, you know, in a f- what people are forgetting, and this is most of your audience, for good or for bad, probably doesn't even know what happened pre-2015. One of your uh, colleagues, uh, Archana Rai, is bringing out a book called The Unicorn Quest. So she just showed me a snippet. I think it's going to get launched soon. Everybody should read it. I don't, I read a few chapters. Everybody should read it because you have to understand what is happening pre-2015. It's a good historical snapshot of what is happening in the ecosystem. And even when you get that context in India, you can't relate to it because you were born into this ecosystem, startup ecosystem post-2015-16, when everything has been rara, right? Like everything is like nothing can fail. There's infinite money. There are only unicorns at the end of the rainbow, etc. Now that in the US also, sadly, has been true for 14 years. So Silicon Valley was made at the peak of that cycle and nothing slumped. It just kept going up further, right? So that's why it seems true because people tend to be even more of pattern matchers and wave catchers in the the US because there's a lot more capital and a much bigger price at the end of the rainbow, right? Which is in India, it's still not proven. So people, yes, here also we went a little insane, but a lot of it was still driven by cross-border capital. So in this winter, when the cross-border capital is shut and the planes are not flying in with boatloads of checks, you can already see the suppression of that because there's only so much risk-taking appetite inside the country. In fact, there is a lot more in the public markets if you can show profitability and you can get there. But private markets has a limitation. So I think this FOMO thing works when there's just crazy amounts of money sloshing around and all trend lines are pointing to the fact that this cannot slow down. So in every economic cycle, like you see in bull markets and bear markets and the public markets, you will see it in the private markets. It's no different. It's just that this time around, the wave lasted for an in, un, you know, unthinkably long time at one shot. So you have irrational exuberance and then uh, incredible gloom. You have these two poles that you switch between. Yeah, yeah, money is driven by fear and greed. Like, an entrepreneur might not be driven by that, but the money is capital that's financing them is driven by that. That's that the mean. fundamental role of both public and private markets. All right. Satish Surya Narayana asks, what contingency plans should one have in case of unexpected challenges or crises? The funding winter could be a good example. How much money should an entrepreneur keep in his liquid or her liquid contingency fund? Two years. Two years worth of runway. Yeah. And then when it gets to one, you should be significantly paranoid. So I think Naveen Tiwari of Inmobi gave us a, a great heuristic, which I use to educate very young founders. I think the two years is a stretch when it comes to young companies. So one is, of course, if you're a large company, you can't risk everything you've built and not have a long runway, right? Unless you feel like you can be underwritten by your existing cap table, which is also conditions change. People who said they would have, they have enough capital might suddenly stop giving you money. So in young companies, you won't have that luxury. So the good rule of thumb that he said allowed him to pivot into Inmobi in the early days. He started as some, he started as an ad tech company called Mcoge when he started, right? So search company, and then he went to an ad tech company. 
So he said, look, the marker on how much capital you raised for what quantum of time, you should constantly benchmark yourself on where you are at versus what you pitched. So suppose eight months have passed out of the 24 months and you're supposed to be at one third the capital that you raised burned. You can never be more than that. That means you're just being, you're burning money silly. I mean, you're fooling yourself, right? So short of calling it a lie, you're, you're fooling yourself. So one, then you should punish it. You punish because you're just, you're selling an artificial business plan to yourself, leave alone the investors. Second, at that one third point, if your goals have not been met, it's a hard time to recalibrate and seeing, do cust- are customers even interested in what I'm building? It loves you for one hard pivot, right? And then a similar mark comes when two thirds of the money is out. But then if you're not, that you tough to hard pivot, but you can soft pivot and you can, you can contain costs, you can extend your runway because to imagine that perfectly in those six to eight months, you will get a perfect round is the biggest foolish mistake that most early stage entrepreneurs make. There is no such magic. Just because you need the money, the capital markets don't show up. That's true of personal as well as professional money. All right, two more questions. Next question we've got from multiple founders. So I have too many to name and many anonymous uh, founders as well saying that often uh, founders are, they talk about being pushed around by aggressive VCs, pushed towards growth, then suddenly pushed towards profit, then pushed towards growth again. How much truth in this matter of VCs pushing founders? And part B of the question, how should founders resist this so-called VC pressure? See, I think there's pressure because of two fronts. One, some people are genuinely concerned that the market or the leader is running away from you and getting funded. So there is a fear that in a thin capital market, if you're not in the top two, then you might not get capital after this. So they're held, they're holding the baby. Mm -hmm. Um, The reason sometimes it feels artificial is that, and founders use VCs as an excuse to push that growth. But I feel eventually no VC knows the business better than the founder, right? And so... If the founder wants to get seduced by that idea and says, I'm playing high stakes poker all or nothing, then it's fine. I mean, both parties are at guilt, um, guilty of, uh, of, of the charge. But fundamentally, I think, sadly, it's the founder's responsibility to push back as, uh, and set the equation straight. See, I know found, founders cannot be choosers in terms of when they go with the bowl to ask for money. God knows who's going to land up, right? You might say, I have five guys who are my top five VCs. I definitely want one of them to give money and none of them give you money. Yeah. And then the eighth guy gives you money who's not even on your rank and you've not heard such great things. Very difficult for an entrepreneur to say, sorry, I won't take your money because I've heard that this quality is not that good as the other five. Certainly, that's the truth. So I wish, you know, all this is retrospective advice where you really can't implement it. You can't go and raise uh, good money just because uh, you know you think uh, that is better than what you actually raised. So then you go, A, you got to live with that risk, right? If you, if you feel like, hey, it's a 10-year journey, I'm willing to risk it. Then along with that, you've taken risks that you know how to control this investor. Otherwise, why are you taking the money? You're going to be, you're the slave under the board and under the capital that is there. Um, and you will be dancing to their tunes. So you have, if you're a strong founder, then you have to put, push back and say, this is, I'm going to stay true to the plan and I'm going to not do things which are uncomfortable in terms of burn. And if you want me to grow faster, then help me articulate the story to raise another round and then I will hit the accelerator. But don't lose sight of the fact that you don't have money after it runs out, right? And don't believe your existing investor or otherwise until the money actually lands up in the bank. So I feel the conversation to be had is, hey, here are the reasons why we should blitz scale right now or grow or not. Okay. You have to win that argument as the founder. You are the best position to win it, not the VC. Once you convince them that it's time to blitz scale, then the VC should help you raise the money and then start spending. Not spending on the back of not having that money and then blaming the VC, saying, oh, he encouraged it. In the board meeting, he didn't say anything. So this is the most often, this is the thing I hear most often. VC was passive, so it was implicit that they approved. Okay. I was like, yeah, but like, Everyone's hopeful, right, that you'll raise the next round. Nobody can guarantee it. It's your life, your employees, your trusted people, 50, 100, 200, 400 years you've spent building this. And you're willing to throw it away on the whim of 
you know, the VC didn't say anything on the boardroom, so I'm going ahead with the plan. So I'm saying, you know, forget about VC pushing you. I'm saying even when you have the motivation, you need to second guess yourself, right, to do that. And uh, I feel that's the only way you can build long term. You can't set these equations incorrectly so early into the journey. The VC, even me, though I've stayed 10 years in all my journeys, I, in the long game of enterprise building, I'm also a temporary visitor. I'll take my money and leave after 10 years. He's building for another 10 after that. How does he care whether it's me or the second VC or who's given him that advice? He, he or she has to figure, out, figure that out for themselves. They're building the long game. All right. That brings us to the end of this show. On behalf of all our viewers, IDFC First Bank and the Economic Times, Karthik Reddy, thank you very much for sharing your insights and for taking time or one full hour of your time to answer our live questions on Ask the Expert. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Suresh and the ET team for the opportunity. And as I said, I always uh, love talking to young entrepreneurs. I hope a lot of them benefit from it. I know you're doing your bit to spread the word and uh, hope we will so try. We keep useful trying. Useful advice for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik. And viewers, thank you for tuning in.